let's kick off this session on design law reform. Quite an interesting time um, worldwide. We have action at the international level in uh, within WIPO. Uh, finally, the design law treaty is slowly getting up off the ground and more and more countries are joining the Hague Agreement, which lets you internationally register designs. We've got action at the regional level, and that's what I'm going to talk about, which is the European changes. And we've got action at the national level, we've got uh, IPO and Australia and uh, elsewhere as well. So quite an exciting, interesting time in design law, I think. Um, but then I'm a design law so I would think that. Um, let me see if I can move the slides on. I don't know why I can't move the slides on. Uh, there's got to be a way, hasn't there? The mouse will do it. So um, I'll introduce my first speaker in more detail when we get off. That. So Jeff Lloyd from the IPO and Dr. Brian uh, Berger from uh, uh, Deakin University in Melbourne. I'll give them a special introduction when they come up to talk. So. I'm going to start off by talking about the EU design law reform. Um, just a bit of history first to sort of locate us in time. Back in 98 to 2001, the directive which harmonised EU national laws was passed. Uh, we ratified it late in the UK, about two weeks late in December 2001. So that's about 22 years ago. The regulation which set up community level protection for designs was implemented in, uh, I think, around May 2002. So again, about 20 years back. And the commission wanted to put the design law system through a 20 year road check, basically. It's an MOT time for the design system. Along the way, the, there was a, a mess over spare parts, which we're gonna look at in a moment. And the commission tried to pass a law harmonising the national EU laws about the design protection of spare parts. Put forward a measure in 2004, and it sort of dragged on like the walking dead for 10 years and was finally abandoned in 2014. So it's been almost a decade since they gave up last time on the attempt to harmonise spare parts. 2011, the uh, very wonderful Max Planck Institute reviewed the design of the trademark system for the EU, and uh, that was implemented. The Max Planck changes were implemented in 26, 2017, and those changes were also implemented in the UK because at that time we were still within the EU system. So trademark directive, trademark regulation, all harmonized UK in lock with the EU, all nice and consistent. Commission had the, the idea, as I say, of doing the same kind of road check on the design system. So they started that pro process with a thing called the economic review, um, the economic aspects of the performance of the design system. And that was published in 2015. And then 2016 is sort of when I come into the picture very slightly uh, because they also commissioned a legal review of live uh, loose ends, legal loose ends in EU design law. And uh, the main author of, of that was uh, Uma, who's uh, um, uh, behind the screen there. Uh, and I came in at the very tail end of that and contributed some bits and pieces on the more practical aspects of that. So 2016 at to 2024, around, you know, seven or eight years from us um, putting, uh, putting that legal review in place some of what we looked at has come to pass. Um, after the legal review, there was uh, fairly wide consultations. 2020, the Commission issued a, a staff working paper, which basically sets out what they've now gone on to do. Uh, draft regulation and directive about a year ago in November 2022. And things have moved fairly quickly after that in terms of the glacial speed of European legislation. Um, Parliament adopted a, an agreed position in November. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, the Council adopted an agreed position in November. Parliament, uh, the legal committee, passed its report also in November. The two of them got together with the Commission to set up what they call a trilogue. 
and the trilogue seems to have reached agreement or convergence anyway on the second meeting on December the 8th. So uh, we're now at the interesting point where they've issued press releases saying they've agreed what they're going to do, but what it exactly isn't yet out there. There's a very high degree of convergence anyway. So to, to a large extent, they're only quibbling about the word in most cases. So we kind of do know what they're going to do, and that's what we're going to look at now. Where is it going to go? It's going to probably be passed by the Parliament in March. That's what's slotted into um, the, uh, the Parliament timetable anyway. And then it's going to provide for a three-year period for implementation by the national offices and probably by the EYPO as well. So that's the timescale. Um, 2027 is when this stuff ought to be in by, by the latest. So um, start by looking maybe at some changes which are of uh, real demonstrable practical importance, I think. Hi. Uh, and the first of these is the spare parts solution to the spare parts issue. Then we're going to look at virtual animated designs, quite whizzy stuff. Uh, unregistered community designs, an interesting development, make of it what you will, and some new defences. So, uh, spare parts, where are we? Under the regulation, there is no protection under design law for the design of a component part of a complex product, read car or motorbike photocopier used for the purpose of repair of that complex product to restore its original appearance. So you can't get a community design test. But the national uh, the, the governments wouldn't agree uh, to pass the same into their national design laws. At the time, the big objections came from France and Germany, who had fairly significant car industries. We kind of didn't at that point, so it, it was not an issue for us. But France and Germany, until very recently, had laws which enabled you to protect spare part designs and enforce and actively car companies actively did so. So um, the directive um, contained this compromise called Freeze Plus, which said you can keep your existing law. If you change it, you've got to liberalize, but you can keep your existing law. And that's what France and Germany did. But um, since the legal review in 2016 and some um, test cases, both France and Germany have introduced repair clauses. So the ice has melted, basically. The resistance has largely gone in principle, albeit Germany has introduced a repair clause with a very long transition period, and France has introduced a really weird one where you get protection for the first few years and then you lose it. So um, this is going to now replace the French and German repair clause is what the EU has now agreed. So what have they agreed? Ah, okay, before we get to that, just a little bit of terminology here for those of you outside this world. Um, designs of spare parts come in two flavors. One is what we call must match spare parts are known as form-dependent spare parts in Germany. And the example is a, a bumper or a bonnet or a side panel or a door or something like that, a car, because it would look pretty stupid if you replaced that with a side panel of a different appearance. It would no longer match the rest of the vehicle. So that's the notion there. Um, the, the reason for denying protection via design law of spare parts which have to match the rest of the vehicle is that the consumer, when they want to replace that part, perhaps it's got damaged, has no option but to select one of the same appearance. And therefore, design protection creates an effective monopoly <coughs> over that spare part. On the other hand, there are other types of, of spare part, like uh, the wheels you get on cars, where you can change, for example, wheel rims without uh, the public being deeply offended or thinking that the car doesn't match anymore and it's pretty standard practice to equip cars with different uh, wheel rims. So must uh, must match and non-must match parts. So here is the here are the two clauses proposed by the Commission. 
protection shall not be conferred, and it looks much like the current um, design regulation, shall not be conferred on a registered design which constitutes a component part of a complex product, spare parts again, but some extra words, upon whose appearance the design of the component part is dependent. So um, the, the repair clause proposed by the commission would only bite on so-called must match spare parts, ones where there is no choice but to copy. So that was something we proposed, not an original suggestion, but that was what we suggested in the legal review as what might be an acceptable compromise uh, between what were then two sides which were way apart. And that's what's been passed in German law. So a repair defence, as currently in, in, in the regulation, but restricted to uh, must-match spare parts. What's happened to that in... Uh, so the council have retained that wording in their agreed position, but the... Um, Parliament proposal is to remove the wording and replace it with, let's get the next slide up, some specific carve outs for, ah, oh, damn thing. Was it, didn't even do that, was it? Right. Now I've lost the. No. Right. Um, <laughs> okay replace it with some specifics. So rims, covers, and similar parts, the shape of which is not determined by the appearance of the complex product. So they're both along the same lines. They're both restricting, accepting what we put forward in the legal review as the compromise between um, allowing free market for uh, component parts, and um, but only where it's essential to copy. So that's where the repair clause seems to be going. Um, the two other issues which were in debate, um, how long before it comes in? So uh, Parliament wanted a, a, a three-year run-in. Uh, the uh, uh, Council wanted a 10-year run-in, so they've agreed eight years, apparently. So uh, eight years after the law comes in, which will be three years from now, this uh, open market for spare parts will apply. And there will be some requirements that the spare, spare part makers label parts with their origin to make it quite clear that they are not original equipment manufacturer parts. So that's the spare parts issue. Finally, after 20 years, they will have harmonized the EU market in spare parts. And that was kind of the driving force for these EU law reforms in the first place 20 years ago. So it's a delayed triumph of harmonization, I see. Um, the next topic I think is quite sexy, virtual designs. So um, it, it, younger people will know that there are virtual worlds out there and you can buy all sorts of interesting things supported by non-fungible tokens. Um, so there's, a, at least until two years ago, there's a really growing economy in NFTs and so on, supporting the trade of virtual images and indeed virtual 3D goods. And that market's kind of crashed a little bit, but nonetheless, still quite sexy from a legal point of view. Um, designs, what are designs? Designs are protection for the appearance of a product. And product means any industrial or handicraft item under our existing design law. But now here's what the commission proposed to do to that, regardless of whether it's embodied in a physical object or materializes in a digital form. So product we all think of you know this is a product this is a product i can throw a product at you you catch a product put it in your pocket and carry it home but um it, there's always been a, a a good argument that actually in legal terms a product could be a non-physical thing a two-dimensional thing or a three-dimensional thing because even the existing law includes um graphic symbols so um but it's going to be absolutely clear beyond a peradventure that products, <laughs> when we talk about the protection, the appearance of products, this will include things which do not have to materialize at all, it can be only on screen or only on display on a wall or into the air or in any form or a hologram or something like that. Um, 
to go with that are some extensions to the acts of infringement. So, um, and this arises from consideration of what to do about 3D printing. 3D printing, very exciting business. And if you or I download a, a file and then apply it onto our 3D printer and produce an item for our own home use, we, we can do that because we've got a private and non-commercial use defense on the design. The question is, what do you do about people who scan the design of Lego bricks, upload files, which you then buy from a 3D store? And there are plenty of those there so that um, people are making money by selling you a file of digital data, which then enables you to do a non-infringing act. And the solution uh, is that the um, design law will now include further acts of infringement for creating, downloading, copying, and sharing or distributing to others on any medium or software recording the design for the purpose of enabling a product or made. Those of you who know anything about UK unregistered design right law might recognize that because that's what we suggested they do in the legal review, create something based on our infringing act of making a design document. That's essentially what that is, but it, it, it constrained to <clears throat> acts concerned with electronic design documents. So that is the that's the measure to deal, you know, deal with 3D printing, continue to allow consumers to do what they've got the right to do as private non-commercial users, but put some constraints on uploaders and, and creators of files. How easy or how difficult it's going to be to, you know, I mean, we're back in enforcement in cyberspace as to how easy that's going to be to enforce. But certainly it's going to be of some significance. Um, together with that, there are some practical issues about how are you going to file these, you know, representations of a virtual object. And the answer is that the, 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 the types of design you'll be able to file will be extended. You'll be able to file had models and things like that. Actually, you already can at the EU IPO, but they will be now treated as the legal form of, of representation. So we will finally move away from paper and pen type representations of designs, um, as we did with trademarks following the Max Planck recommendation. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit over that stuff. Um, and uh, just show you a couple of examples of virtual 3D designs. I quite like this one. We filed this one in the first year of the community design system. It's a little cartoon character called Sergeant Stripes, which was a, um, I think it was a TV cartoon, but it, it, you know, this is what you do. You file a picture from all languages, exactly as if you were protecting a doll, but it isn't a doll. It says in the description of the product cartoon character. Um, this one, uh, a lady called Eva Cash from a game called Dirt Origin of the Species, which I believe um, it carried the dubious reputation of being voted the, the, the most rip-off video game of the year when it was put out, because she's kind of a bit like, uh, uh, what's her name, Lara Croft, clearly based a little bit on Lara Croft with a different haircut. Um, this here, 3D flowers for use in virtual environments. I don't know whose 3D garden this very beautiful digital flower will adorn, but you know, just to show you, people are already filing these things, but this legalizes the practice. Um, some additional changes to definitions of what a design is, which um, to some extent confirm what you can already do, but give it legal force. One of them is to allow you to register a set of things all together if you want to. So like all the chess pieces, and the board all in one if you want to, rather than registering each one separately. So that sets of articles, interior layouts. And then in, in terms of the definition of what a design is at the moment, uh, the, the EU law and the UK law says design is the appearance of a product, uh, including features of shape um, or color or contour or whatever. And the definition will now explicitly include movement, transition, or any form of animation of those features. So not just the way things look in a static sense, but the way things look when they're changing their form. Um, something which obviously since uh, uh, in, in recent years is a feature of a lot of, uh, of uh, home electronics. Unregistered community designs. Now here we have, a, a, 
not really intellectually interesting, but certainly quite a practically important issue. And the issue is whether basically everyone's designs get this form of protection or basically only Europeans get this form of protection. And you would have thought a fairly big call like that one would have been explained 20 years ago when the law was being passed. And if not explained then, then at least clarified since, but it hasn't really been. And there hasn't been much case law on it. There was a case in Germany called Gebeke Presse Zwei, which was about um, things for injecting uh, cookie dough into a pan. And uh, that said that the first disclosure of a design must be in the EU if you want this form of protection, geographically in the EU. And then just before Brexit came a case called Beverly Hills Teddy Bear in which um, Judge Haken held that it was not act to clear whether it had to be in the EU or not, refer the thing to the court, uh, a court of justice. Um, and then very inconsiderately, the party settled as parties occasionally do, and we never got a court of justice decision. So we don't know whether the first disclosure has to be in the EU or not. But the, re the reason why the German Supreme Court said the disclosure did have to be in the EU was this sentence. Pursuant to Article 11, a design which has not been made public within the territory of the community shall not enjoy protection as under the community design. And that is what is going to be deleted. There's no great song or dance about what this is for, why it's being deleted, but we put it in the legal review, this deletion, for the, and said they should put it in to clarify whether the first disclosure had to be in the EU or not. And in the staff working paper, it's also clear that that's what they're doing. They're clarifying whether the first disclosure has to be in the EU or not. They haven't done it really in the very best possible way, but the reason is I think they wanted to slip this one in under the radar, which they've done very effectively because nobody knows it's there. So that is very good news, I think, for British designers because we have had the stupid situation for a few years where a British fashion designer has to say to themselves, am I going to put my new range on the catwalk in London Fashion Week, in which case the first disclosure is outside the EU and I won't get protection in the EU? Or shall I do it in Paris Fashion Week and risk not having protection in the UK? This, From this end, it looks like the EU ha has um, withdrawn the difficulty. And interestingly enough, since our UK law also lacks this sentence, arguably we are also in the same position of I think, granting protection for disclosures, not limited <laughs> to if they're in the UK. They have to come to the attention of people in the UK, but they don't have to be in the UK or the EU respectively. I think that's the situation we're in. Um, the defences, I'm going to skip a little bit over these, other than to note that what the, what the Commission and, and Parliament are doing is harmonising design law defences to some extent with copyright law defences. Um, and uh, so the defences include uh, referring to a product or comment, critique or parody. Um, and within the recitals, um, the instruction is that you have to apply this provision in such a way that ensures full respect for fundamental rights and freedoms, and in particular, the freedom, freedom of expression. And that's, I think, oh, and they also refer to artistic expression, not just um, expression of thought, but also artistic freedom. So that, I think, would, would have the effect of putting at EU level what the Dutch court did in the Nadia Klesner Darfurnik case, where they held that um, despite the reproduction of this Louis Vuitton registered community design in the painting concerned, it was uh, protected free speech and free freedom of artistic expression. So I think that's probably the way that's going. Um, look at some legally interesting points, but I'll go fairly briefly over these. Uh, so the uh, do do designs have to be visible? Which you might think is a stupid question. Of course they do, but there was some arguments about it in the beginning as to whether the kind of designs you feel the tactile designs um, uh, should be protected. So in legal review, we said remove the confusion and 
Council and Parliament and the Commission all proposed to do that by saying, whilst visibility might be relevant, it's not necessary to be visible at all times or in any particular situation, which will undo the effect of the um, biscuits pooled case about cookies, where the court held that the lovely dewy filling of a cookie wasn't a feature of the design of the cookie because it wasn't visible while the cookie was being sold, only when you took a great big bite out of it. So um, I, I think what this is going to do is remove, um, over, override the, the, uh, the biscuits pool case. Technical function, we again <laughs> recommended some clarification of the scope of the technical function exception. We've had case law since then, the Dossaram case in the Court of Justice, but the uh, council are proposing to insert, do I, have I skipped over it? Council, uh, council proposed to insert in the recitals designs with technical function and not excluded from design protection. Again, that's really just clarificatory to explain that designs which are wholly dictated by function can't be protected, but those which just have a technical function shouldn't be excluded on that basis. Um, indication of product, I'll jump over that, I think. Uh, and I'll jump over that because um, whilst it's an interesting issue, um, so very briefly, the overlap between copyright and design protection, um, the, the commission proposes to, to change references to national copyright law and replace them with the phrase, the requirements of union copyright law, which is interesting um, because we don't have a proper union copyright law. We've got a bunch of different bits of union copyright law, but there it is, union copyright law. Um, so uh, it, 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 the intention is clearly to remove the discretion of national courts as to how they apply the design copyright overlap. Um, Again, intellectually interesting, cultural heritage. And this popped up not in any of the preparatory documents, not in the commission proposals, but in um, the council's deliberations. So the proposal is that any member state may provide that a design shall be refused registration where it contains a total or partial reproduction of elements belonging <coughs> to cultural heritage that are of national interest. And the recital explains that this might be artifacts, handicrafts, costumes, monuments, or a group of buildings. Um, the background to this, as maybe some of you may know, is that Italy has been in recent years treating its cultural heritage law as kind of an infinite copyright. So cultural heritage protection, great. If you know, stop people climbing on your monuments or chipping bits off of them. But um, in the last couple of years, the Italian courts have enforced injunctions against people in Germany selling reproductions of Renaissance Italian artworks, which are the uh, curated by some museum. So uh, quite a, an interesting sort of bit of development about protection of cultural heritage in, Isi in Italy, which we generally treated in design law as being a third world issue, cultural heritage, piracy of cultural heritage, cultural appropriation from the third world to the first world. Well, this is Italy saying, no, 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 we've got the cultural heritage here. Don't you go pinching our cultural heritage. Interesting to see how far this one will go and whether it will have any, you know, interesting impacts on the design law treaty process, which got stuck for many years on precisely this issue of protection of cultural heritage. Okay, I'm going to skip over that. Um, anybody here actually file designs? Because if not, I'll skip over the next few slides too. Anybody? You do. Okay. okay. All right. Quite a lot of changes, um, but the main the main headline change is that whereas the recital at the moment uh, the, the the directive is very short and doesn't put much of a straitjacket on national design laws. Um, it will now be harmonised in very large part with the regulations so that EU national design laws will come much closer together. Um, in many of these areas, it leaves us in harmony because we already had the, the relevant 
uh, provisions, but in some things like um, um, uh, harmonization of the deferment period to 30 months will be out of step. So lots of changes. They're going to put fees up. Well, it's been 20 years that the fees have been at the same level, so it's probably due. Um, they're going to simplify the fees, very welcome. Uh, and they're going to get rid of the pesky unity of class requirement, which makes it difficult to file designs. So that's um, a quick tour through. You know, there's a huge amount of change, but it's pretty much been agreed now. And you'll see the package emerging, I would think, uh, in January. So that's that's the way it is. We'll take questions at the end, I think, uh, unless anyone's got anything of burning importance or interest. Okay, so let, yeah, of course. Yeah. You said that they, that thing is deleted. Yeah. Article one hundred and ten, a two second, uh, five second sentence. Yeah. The thing that says specific article is yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. In the EU. When is it deleted from? Article one hundred and ten, a five of the Community Design Regulation. So it's in there already. That provision was in the one that says okay. yes. That's right. It was put in. It was snuck in. Um after the passage of the design regulation when the EU expanded. So it came in by virtue of an EU expansion treaty, which is a pretty shifty way of, of legislating, but that was what they did. Um, so that's the end of what I have for you. And if I can figure out how, I will now pass you over to Jeff. Quick to exit. Quick. Right, exit. No joy? No, no, no. I'm quite sure why it's doing that. Mm. Uh, it would. Okay. Oh, there we go. I think it's working. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Okay. Well, you know, um, um, as David said, I'm a policy deputy director at the IPO. I work on trademarks and designs policy. Um, and there's my details up there. There's my email address because um, I've never managed to order business cards. So I'll put that up there in case anyone does need to email me. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things. So it's going to be a bit of a presentation in two parts. So I'm going to talk about um, what we're doing domestically on UK design law. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the design law treaty at WIPA that, that David has already mentioned. So um, starting with our designs review. Um, so the, the context for this review is that design law in the UK hasn't been looked at in a fundamental way for quite some time. Um, we did some fairly minor changes in the 2014 IP Act, some of which haven't actually even been implemented. So um, you know, there hasn't been a lot done with design law in the UK for some time. And as, as David has now explained, you know, nothing fundamental happened in the EU while we were still a member state. So we haven't got uh, the same sort of context like the trademark directive, which we implemented just before we left the EU. And frankly, the UK was quite instrumental in negotiating so and, and got a lot of what we wanted out of it. But we, you know, we, we were happy with trademark where trademark law landed. Um, design law hasn't been touched in the same way and fundamentally reformed in the same way. So we're in um, we're in a very different place. So um, we have kicked off a piece of work a couple of years ago uh, that we're calling the Designs Review. Um, it's a high ambition review. Um, we want to look at as much as we possibly can. Um, all of obviously reviewing IP is subject to politics and everything like that, but we are doing a, we want to do a high ambition review um, that recognizes that, that design law hasn't been touched in a while. And as some people will, it's often called the Cinderella right by um, uh, by some people um, because it, it tends to be the, you know, the last, last to the ball. Um, so um, key to this is stakeholder engagement. So we want to you know, we want to improve the experience for users of the system. So that's the aim of the review. So we want to hear the views of people who are involved in designs and people who work with design law on a daily basis. Um, so where have we got to? Um, so we we did what's called a call for views in January to March of 2022. Uh, a call for views is 
kind of what it says on the tin, but it's a very open call for here are some of the things we're looking at in design law. What do you think we could do with them? So we we did a call for views in January to March. We got a good response. Uh, we did a survey alongside that for small businesses to reach out to loan designers and, and small businesses. Um, we got uh, 56 responses to the consultation, which is, is not bad for a for a fairly, you know, a somewhat niche area of the law, shall we say? So I think it's uh, I think it's uh, you know that was a good level of responses. We were pleased with that. Um, we looked at the responses. We published a government response in the summer of 2022, um, setting out some of the key themes that we thought needed further exploration, and then. Um, this wonderful acronym, which is Retained EU Law. I don't know if you've heard of it. I'm sure you have. Um, it's uh, This thing came along uh, in uh, late 2022 uh, with a bill uh, that was proposing a sunset of retained EU law, and that diverted a lot of resources away from the designs review necessarily because we, you know, we had to look at the entirety of IP retained EU law as an office um, and set out to ministers you know, what, what we wanted to preserve and what we wanted to do with everything. So the work slowed down um, during the back end of 2022 and into early 2023. Um, but uh, this summer we have properly spun back up the work with policy development, with detailed policy development of proposals um, that we intend to uh, conclude. We intend to conclude that policy development phase towards the end of the year or into early 2024. Um, and then the plan is to consult on policy proposals in around mid-2024, uh, recognising that there's a UK general election at some point in 2024, most likely. Um, and you know that might slightly shift the timetable a bit. Um, so it's still a far reaching review. So uh, I'll just run through some of the topics that we are looking at. So key issues, complexity. We've got a lot of overlapping rights in designs. We've got three unregistered rights at the moment, plus registered rights, uh, plus registered designs, plus there is an overlap with copyright. You can claim copyright protection for some things that would be classed as a design. So there's a lot of complexity there. Um, so we want to look at that. Um, so we want to see whether we can simplify design law and design protection and the different rights. But a key message from the Court for Views, which we are obviously listening to, is let's not lose the key elements of protection. So we don't want to simplify rights and uh, uh, and take away elements of the protection that that uh, that designers rely on. Um, there's another key issue which is outstanding from from some has been outstanding for some years and um, so which is criminal sanctions for unregistered design infringement. We criminalized uh, the infringement of registered designs in the 2014 IP Act. Um, we haven't. There is no criminal sanction for unregistered design infringement at the moment. Um, there are differing views about whether criminal sanctions are a good idea or not for infringement of unregistered designs. Um, so we feel there is a need for further evidence. So we're going to try and get that out of our consultation in due course. Um, we have post-Brexit issues. So um, David talked quite a bit there about disclosure of unregistered designs. That was a That is a post-Brexit issue that we still do, do need to look at. Um, Taking in, taking account of what the EU is doing in that area, so um, that is an important, you know, an important issue that we still need to look at. Um, and then future proofing the system, so things like file types, things like how you deal with graphical user interfaces and animations, as as David touched on in his presentation. So, um, you know, what can we do to to bring bring the the system into the 21st century almost and future proof it so that um so that ideally it's it's fit for purpose going forward um and then there's also a question of whether we can increase the value of registered design rights at the moment we don't search on novelty of a design when you apply for one at the ipo by default you can pay for a search if you want to 
um, but we don't do it by default. So um, there's a question of whether we should be doing that to increase the actual value of the design um, rather than it just having a formalities exam and going on, going on to the register. So increasing the value, and then there's a handful of enforcement issues. So uh, our counter infringement strategy that the office published some years back talked about um, whether we can cover, we can move design infringement into the small claims track of the uh, intellectual property enterprise court. So that's one thing we're thinking about. Um, the One of the real messages, the key messages we're getting <laughs> from small designers uh, and loan designers is enforcement is expensive for them. So we want to look at what we can do about that um, and make enforcement more accessible. Uh, I've mentioned criminal sanctions already. And then there is a, an outstanding point from the 2014 Act, which is designs opinions. So that's, we have a regulation making power in the 2014 IP Act to introduce a service where you can request an opinion on a design from the office, similar to, we have a similar service for patents already. Um, that has never been implemented from the 2014 Act. Um, so that is something else that we want to we want to look at. So that's our um, a quick canter through our domestic review. Um, it is, you know, we are, as I said, I can't say enough. We are ambitious for it. Um, so we will we'll see what uh, what happens uh, next year. And just to say that the consultation I've mentioned the core reviews, the consultation will be about specific policy proposals. So it is a more definitive, uh, a more definitive policy statement and asking for opinions on policy options. Do, do you know when that might be, Jeff? The consultation we are saying mid 2024. We would like to yeah, I think subject to elections and all Yeah, subject to elections. I mean fundamentally, um, you know, I can I'm quite happy to be perfectly candid about it. It would be good to get it done before a general election so that we can you know we have we have the work done and ready before um before uh, ministers return or new ministers arrive so that's where we are on the design review i will quickly go through uh the design law treaty which is at the other end of the scale so from out from the uk to the global environment and wipo the world intellectual property organization so the original design law treaty was proposed more than a decade ago. Uh, and as David mentioned, it stalled. Um, there were there, there are issues around, or there were issues around disclosure of cultural heritage and what is called tra uh, uh, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions. So there are different views within WIPO on that. Um, and for that reason, the, the treaty stalled. Uh, the 2022 WIPO General Assemblies uh, agreed by a vote to convene a diplomatic conference to agree a treaty uh, in 2024, uh, which has kick-started the process again. Uh, so if you've never heard of the design of the treaty, um, it's probably why, because nothing's happened on it for about 12 years, um, but now it is. So... Um, the treaty itself is a, essentially a formalities treaty, so it sets up minimum standards for national offices around the world and how they deal with designs. Um, but you know there are certain there are certain certain things that certain certain parts of WIPO are pushing for. So where have we got to on the design law treaty since that decision? So there were preparatory meetings in WIPO in October that my team attended. Um, that established the processes and the rules of procedure for the diplomatic conference. And they also agreed the venue and the dates. So the diplomatic conference on the design law treaty will take place from the 11th to the 22nd of November, 2024 in Riyadh. So um, perhaps after that, there will be a Riyadh treaty on design. Mm -hmm. um, one of the issues with the preparatory meetings is that um, there were additional proposals added to the text. So what we now have is quite a substantial text and a lot to agree and a lot for us now to analyze as an office uh, and to decide what you know what is compatible with, with UK law and what, what isn't and what we can sign up to and what we can't. Um, 
there aren't any formal negotiations scheduled now between now and next November, but that doesn't mean there isn't going to be international engagement. You know, we plan to work with other offices to try and uh, to try and build common ground, given the amount of text that needs to be got through in a fortnight in the desert in Saudi Arabia. Um, so, does the EU IPO have separate representation at that? Conference, or would it just be the individual state? So, uh, it's, it's so I think the EU IPO itself is represented. There is also an EU delegate, right? But member states will also be there. So, um, generally, the EU will advocate a common position, as you'd expect. Um, but in <laughs> rare instances where the EU can't agree a common position, they uh, they defer to member states to speak. Yeah, I was just going to um, clarify that the EU is a member of the of the uh, of WIFA, so yeah, you know, right, right, right. it is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, so we will be working with other countries between now and next November to try and get established some common ground. Um, you know, one of the one of the things, the key messages we get from design stakeholders when we talk about international. Uh, the international environment is the desire for harmonization. So we think a treaty is desirable, but we aren't necessarily going to agree at any price because there are there are still things to resolve. Um, and the other thing we will be doing over the next few months, as well as engaging with countries, is also engaging with design stakeholders on the text um, to uh, to 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 just to to sense check our own thinking and to get views on that. So. That's it from me on the domestic and global picture. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Again, I'd say if, if there are any burning questions, ask them now, but otherwise we'll, we'll take questions at the end. Um, and in the meantime, while I fiddle around with the IT, I'd uh, like to uh, give an speaker, uh, Dr. Tyrone Berger. We're lucky enough to have Tyrone over for a couple of months at Queen Mary as a visiting scholar. Uh, he's an academic at Deakin University in Melbourne. And what we have to do now is stop sharing. Uh, and his special area is design law. Um, he's recently published Australian Design Law and Practice. And I think, uh, Tyrone, am I right to think you've been involved a little bit in the Australian design law reform process that uh, yes. uh, we're going to talk about now? Great. Um, so I have to click to exit. Click to shut it down. And I think it's that middle one, isn't it? Yes. It's a sticky mouse, that's the trouble. Uh, you want to you want to go? Yeah. I don't want to hold you up. All right. So, which which one am I? Just click on that there, and you should. Yeah. There right. you go. And okay. then just click through. Or uh, use ideally, it. that should do it. But <clears throat> yeah, you're good. All right. I'll give you that. I'll click that off. Just in case. I get confused. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much, David. Um and. I guess I'm going to be the uh, the case study for tonight. I'm only going to talk about Australian law. Um, there's a comparative aspect that I could also draw into um, later on, but also um, we are all going to be um, present at the end of next year for the DLT as well. So again, uh, it crosses over some of the topics and discussions that we've already had uh, for tonight. I'm I'm going to be fairly descriptive, but I don't want to get into the weeds too much because I understand that Australian law is not going to be everyone's cup of tea, and I'm you know, there will be, a, I guess, a, a catch up, you know, because some of the things that uh, I guess I'll be talking about are relevant more to the Australian system than, than overall uh, design law form, but also harmonisation was also the topic for uh, tonight's discussion. So uh, thank you to uh, Orma, who is, I hope, still online. She is, yes. Thank you to Orma for inviting me tonight. And thank you to Queen Mary for the uh, hosting this uh, month as well. Um, it's been a real pleasure, and also the uh, weather has been pretty special. <laughs> uh, but I'm leaving tomorrow, so um, uh, it will be with a heavy heart, so I have to uh, move on and go home. 
So today I want to I want to discuss about the Australian the Australian experience. Now the when I say the um, experience, I'm really referring to quite a while um, ago that there was an Australian um, uh, design law reform inquiry, uh, which has taken more than ten years to get to this point. So I'll go through some details of that, and it could be a happy story uh, from <laughs> design, um, but of course there's always uh, um, you know unwanted consequences, and and when you get into the detail. Um, I guess the office has also got some further challenges ahead of itself. So I'm going to talk about the uh, Australian design experience um, from a ACIP report, um, which is the advisory, so the former advisory council on intellectual property uh, that was published in 2015. And today has seen an amending act in 2021. So there has been some work and development uh, behind the scenes and also uh, an act that was published only a couple of years ago. There has been another public consultation this year, uh, which is going over sort of old ground a little bit in that respect, uh, because the recommendations have been on the books for um, seven, eight years. Uh, but also uh, the recommendations, sorry, the, the recommendations and the subsequent act also included in the policy development stages uh, issues to do with virtual and partial. And I was in the office at the time. Uh, dealing with that. So in the, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I was at the IP office for more than six years uh, leading up to this period. Um, I did leave and I'm now taking a position that we can uh, in 2021-22. And I think that most of the consultation papers um, probably had my sort of fingerprints or dirty bits over, over most of that, including the Hague uh, cost benefit analysis, which I also led uh, for three years in Australia. So um, don't blame me, the results are out and also the office is um, moving on to um, bigger and better things. So um, just to uh, give you some background and how we got here, I guess uh, is probably you know, good to sort of give you a context of how long it's taken, but also the work that's been done uh, leading up to this point. So as I said, 2015, ACIP delivered a final report uh, on the Designs Act in Australia providing 22 recommendations. Many of these recommendations um, were proposed to streamline the design system, which again, um, like other design systems and jurisdictions, have been under sort of uh, un under nurtured, under 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 the radar, um, but also have not received a lot of attention. Um, and some of the concerns were about harmonisation as well. Although international harmonisation and changes in law um, come at a very slow pace, as most of us agree. Um, and also they're not necessarily the outcomes that we started from, so the end result can be quite different. The government accepted many of these recommendations. And there was a subsequent review uh, by the Productivity Commission uh, that finalised in 2016, encouraging the government to implement the ACIP review recommendation. More recently, the accepted recommendations of the former ACIP inquiry were enacted in the Designs Amendment ACIP Response Act 2021. So I'm just going to look at some of the implemented basic recommendations. This is uh, history now, but I think that just to give you some context, that some of these things uh, are relevant and also are coming on radars across uh, other jurisdictions as well. Of the implemented recommendations, I just want to draw a few um, that came through uh, and, and really were the driving force of, of the bill and subsequent act in 2021. The first one was a grace period, important uh, implementation of, um, I guess, reforms to um, the designs that providing applicants with a 12 month period or a grace period. And it simply, simply means that any publication of or use of the design by the owner to which the design is identical, substantially similar uh, in overall impression made within or before the 12 month filing period uh, can be disregarded from the um, prior art base. The second one was uh, the infringement exception uh, exemption, so for prior use, introduced an exemption to protect third parties from infringing somebody else's design if the third party starts using that design before the filing or priority date of the registered design. Uh, the next one is the relief relief from infringement before registration. And again, this is a window where you file a design and you have a publication maybe six months later, um, unbeknown to third parties in the public. Um, you don't know if that design is available to uh, the public domain. Uh, and this provides a scope of what's called uh, an innocent infringer, which is quite interesting. And it can be up to six months. 
Uh, and finally, the other um, interesting little reform that sort of slipped in there, but it's been obviously discussed widely across the design community and IP communities, is the fact that ex exclusive licensees could not commence legal action without the authority or permission of the design owner. So in this respect, the changes made it that uh, exclusive licensees could commence legal action um, against an alleged infringer. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about those particular reforms. What came out of that was quite a positive reaction in terms of the changes, but also it was much overdue. And the opportunity to give credit, uh, even though many of us have moved on to the greater passes. Um, the, the next consultation, or I guess round of consultations, commenced this year. Um, and I call them Reforms 2.0 I mean, because I can uh, say that I've, I've done most of this work before and it came up again. This was actually carved out of the ACIP response bill. Uh, at the time, I was sitting in the room and there was a couple of reasons, but um, the bottom line was that there was divide or there was division amongst the uh, submissions and a lot of the stakeholders didn't have a, a third model as to what the office was going to implement. Um, and to be honest, it was actually quite confusing uh, and probably made us more sort of aware of many of the issues that we hadn't thought about at the time. Taking off my policy hat for uh, a minute and going back to um, my academic uh, opinion. So this was an ongoing review of uh, the design system, Australia, um, IP Australia conducted the public consultation with the Fed. The first two problems or the first two reforms that they're proposing, and again, I, I say this, is that um, uh, these are proposals that have been well and truly done uh, in terms of policy development, but also there's been public consultations uh, privately and publicly on these issues. And also the, uh, I guess, the uh, uh, drafting instructions and, and bill will be slated for some time later on this year as well. Uh, sorry, next year as well. So uh, when I say these are proposals, I would secure that and I've been fairly secure in, in saying that they're going to go ahead um, in some form or another. So the first two deal with um, virtual designs and partials, which we've already talked about tonight on, on the subject of virtuals. They will increase, uh, I guess, scope protection, uh, the significant changes to the definition of protection offered by Australian law. But the third proposal, a bit of a wild card, and I've, I've kept it for last, is incremental designs. And this is a new idea that the office has brought in um, and it's going to sort of run up the flagpole, pole, so to speak, and see how it goes. And it has, actually has been uh, quite a controversial decision in Australia, in so much as they've had to drop half the proposal in terms of the preliminary design and settling on the linking or the post registration linking of the design, which I'll get to uh, in a few minutes. So again, the third proposal is rather procedural in, mo in, in nature, but it does have implications and impact on the definition of design and the scope of protection as well. Did I get to... So there you go. So... Why am I not on the right page, David? So that's a very good question. You are on page five. Yep. Uh, on page five. Okay. What, which one are you on? Yep. Virtual design. Several changes. Thank you. So I'm just going to start with virtual design, which is the first proposal coming out of public consultation this year. So currently, virtual designs are not protected in Australia, um, and we're talking about graphic user interfaces, GUI, uh, but we can also include in that you know, icons, um, animated icons, screen savers, automated. So augmented reality um, and even virtual reality environments as well. So there's a broad sort of, I guess, you know, group of uh, types of designs and also products that sort of come out of that discussion. Uh, but at the moment uh, in Australia, we don't protect virtual designs, as, as you might know, that if the product is turned off, a lot of these icons or virtual designs on our devices are not, um, are not visible. Uh, and of course, the office has taken that view that if it's turned off, the product is not in use. Um, the virtual design cannot be. Uh, virtual, uh, sorry, this proposal, uh, again, I just wanted to emphasize going back to the connection between this and, and some of the other discussions tonight. This is going to bring Australia into harmonization with a lot of other jurisdictions, including the UK and the EU. The first, the current definition of the product includes a thing in Australian law that is manufactured or ha handmade. And obviously this is a sticking point with respect to virtual technology uh, design. Um, so there's gonna have to be a proposal put forward to adding virtual designs 
as an additional type of product, um, and that is a virtual product uh, that is the expression uh, adopted by IPS Australia. The second question is regard to the definition whether it will expand or extend the protection to non-physical products that are non-functional, uh, such as video content, uh, which are which is arguably also more appropriately protected by copyright. So again, a lot of this detail we won't know until the exposure draft early next year, and a lot of these, uh, I guess, issues have been already um, tested in the uh, consultation. Second, the expression visual features would need to be amended and broadened out to allow protection of virtual uh, products, such as icon screws and, uh, and screen savers. And third, since a design application must identify the products in each design, so the products each design is for, for example, uh, clarification for clarification purposes, the application must clearly identify the product's nature and intent. For example, a virtual design described as a user interface for a copy machine is okay, but just having a description of user interface would not be um, under the proposal. Just to continue with virtual designs, um, looking at representation, the images or the um, pictures and photos or drawings that you often uh, put forward in terms of filing a design application, this would also extend <clears throat> to representations where the visual features need to be shown in their active state. Um, or where there is a dynamic design, applicants should consider a series of representations showing the visual features at different times of the device or product. This may cause some difficulties. Um, of course, there are different technologies, and as technologies update and change, now, not only to do with, uh, I guess, you know, 3D printing and the like, uh, this can also um, affect, I guess, the sort of broad based uh, formalities issues that the uh, office might have with representation. Okay, so what are some of the issues to do with virtual? Well, there are two other aspects I wanted to focus on. Um, there might be more, but also uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them after tonight's presentation. Uh, one of them is obviously being infringement, infringement um, and the other one being the overlap issues with the Copyright Act. And I don't want to go too much down that rabbit hole, but I think that um, what's come to my attention uh, more recently is that you will have a lot of people who are very keen, or very obviously knowledgeable in copyright law, and they'll always ask the question, well, what about copyright? So you do have to address the question of copyright overlap. Um, it does come back to me often as a design person, but also copyright people have the um, right to say that there will be um, dual protection under certain circumstances. So a registered design is primarily infringed by the making of a product. And in this context, a virtual design can be made by writing or compiling uh, code that results in a program where it runs to uh, produce certain visual features. Therefore, clarification needs to be sought here. Interestingly, second, uh, secondary infringement, etc., uh, for example, dealings with a product once made, IPS rate proposes a list of exceptions, study, testing, research, etc., that would amount to an infringement exception on the basis of reasonable mm -hmm. use. This is quite a change and also mirrors the copyright um, provisions in the Australian Copyright Act. So with the implementation of virtual designs comes the issue of copyright protection, if not only because of that change in um, uh, looking at infringement. Uh, in this sense, uh, IP Australia has identified a number of issues. Uh, however, the expression shape and configuration would be interpreted to um, would be would need to be interpreted to 2D, 2D designs such as virtuals. Another question for the office would be whether virtuals could be considered to have visual features of shape and configuration in the same way as physical products. And finally, what is applied industrially? I don't think you have that expression here. No, not since the uh, yeah, not since 1998. Yes, used to. well, yes. I will get to that yeah, maybe a little uh, bit later. I still no. Um, but anyway, um, and what would apply industrially mean for uh, intangible products since they are not manufactured in the traditional sense? So the overall question for the copyright overlap for the office, I think, should apply to uh, whether whether it should apply to virtual products in the same way it does to physical products. <clears throat> right, moving on to partial designs, which is the second reform proposal. Um, again, I would say both. Virtuals and partials will be guaranteed to be in the next field. 
um, as proposals, but I guess the detail is still being worked out and consultations have uh, already finished. So uh, a lot of that policy development will be uh, going through now. So like virtual designs, legal protection for partial designs in Australia is not available. Uh, that is a part of the product made in one piece, cannot be registered under the Designs Act. Both proposals arguably um, are representing a significant shift in policy in Australian law. Um, and I guess one way of looking at it is that both reforms will also benefit um, foreign applicants over local applicants as we are a net importer of technology in Australia. So uh, there was an argument to carve out both uh, virtuals and partials back at the last sort of uh, legislative uh, uh, enactment. Uh, but keeping in mind that uh, there's been a lot of other developments in the, in the design space in Australia as well, and that is whether the question, sorry, over the question of whether Australia should join the Hague Agreement, which is the global um, design filing um, system uh, that we have at the moment. Uh, so this time around, uh, the outcome has been more certain, I guess, from the public consultation. We didn't put forward three and four models for every proposal, and obviously that brought the result last time uh, and probably brought down both the proposals in the uh, 2021 uh, bill. But um, I think for this proposal, uh, or both proposals, uh, there was a degree of certainty. But there will be some key changes from partials, uh, in introducing partials into the Australian system as well. One, again, re re revising, uh, I guess, the device definition of design, similar to virtual, an expanded definition of design uh, will include partial designs and in keeping with the current assessment design, uh, a partial design would be defined as the overall appearance of a part of a product for both physical and virtual products. So there will be some overlap between the two proposals. And the proposal specifies that the partial design must be embodied in the product. This would allow, for example, a logo to uh, be embodied in a specific product as well as similar products. Uh, the, next, the next, I guess, amendment would need to consider indicating the partial design itself. In addition to providing the usual representation, uh, partial design will allow uh, I will allow visual indicators in the representation and um, applicants to support the uh, support their representation with a written claim specifying the part of the product to which the protection is sought. Um, there is no formal detail. Um, I don't think there's any information about what that might look like, but the written claim would be something in support of, I guess, um, identifying the part product in the representations itself. I'm just going to move quickly on to the next one. Partial designs also uh, will impact upon the, I guess, the newness or distinctiveness, that is the scope of protection um, or the registrability of the designs under the Australian system. I don't want to go into the test, for example, uh, but this will also include uh, introducing new similar products that's equivalent to the ones used uh, for trademarks. Another modification uh, that will be made to the substantial similarity test is that the court or registrar, the registrar of designs, must focus on the visual features of the partial designs and in the process uh, could consider any unclaimed part of the product for the purposes of understanding what the claimed part is. Now, in Australian law, you, as you might already know, uh, we have registration over the whole product. So this will be quite a uh, dramatic uh, change for applicants. Uh, so changes necessary. Yes, one more. Uh, changes necessary. Um, I'm just going to continue on. Uh, on the subject of infringement, uh, and it will generally stand that a registered design for a hairbrush would not infringe a registered design for a toothbrush. However, it is proposed that the existing test for infringement be adapted to uh, partial designs, that is, infringing products could include any product similar to the product in the registration. For example, an overall impression of a handle of a water jug, uh, a water jug, mug, or cup would be relevant for assessing substantial similarity. Uh, I think there were some divided opinions on this subject, and it may change uh, before we get to the uh, final outcome. Personally, I think this suggestion could be problematic, and the same test could be applied um, to partial designs as to whole products. That is infringement occurs when a person makes or deals with a product uh, that embodies a design that is identical to the substantial similar impression to the registered design. 
Again, there's an issue of copyright protection relevant to partial designs. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to pass over that. But there are two important developments that follow uh, this proposal. And that is the, uh, I guess, the abolition of uh, SOMS, so kind of uh, newness and distinctiveness, which is like a, a statement we put forward to um, draw the attention to the uh, decision maker or the register or examiner uh, as to what you need to focus on in terms of the design and also common design, which is obviously replacing, uh, which is being replaced by partial design and it is no longer needed. So, Ah, so best for life. And this is also an interesting proposition that um, I don't think too many countries or jurisdictions have incremental designs. Are there any, David, that I'm... Well, now, interesting that you say this. I think, but when you, you've explained it, I'll come back with yeah. you. I think it might be a bit like what we used to have in the UK in the olden days called um, associated designs. Oh, OK. Um, so... Uh, but the Japanese have recently introduced something quite like this. Okay. And it may be that that is one of the influences on the... It could be, yeah. And it's also taken a hit in the last few months in terms of the public consultation. So <laughs> um, where, it, where it lands, it'll be uh, interesting to, to watch this. Right. So the next proposal is incremental design. And um, the problem identified is designs are developed uh, using an incremental process rather than a linear process involving idealization and prototyping type prototyping type prototyping or prototype prototyping and testing more specific to the design system designers face uncertainty about when to file their design application immediately after uh, they've reached the final form of their design uh, file an application immediately um, after they've released it to the market or then file or then file uh, applications later in the public consultation earlier this year there were two proposals put forward Preliminary design and post registration linking. Uh, IP Australia has actually uh, dropped the preliminary design, uh, but he's going forward, I suspect, with the post registration linking. And this is basically an idea that you permit design owners who file the main design or the original design and link it with the subsequent design with incremental improvements to the earlier registration or main design. And I hope that sort of makes it a little bit clearer everyone tonight. So there's a few points to make about this proposal. And, and again, this is a fairly new proposal. We haven't done a lot of policy work uh, in Australia. Um, and it obviously came out of the office, or has been coming out of the office since my, uh, well, it actually started before I left, but I, I won't go into anything that was said before that, before that time. An application for linking can be made at any time while the main design remains current. So you have a first design which has a period of return of registration and you can link that to a subsequent design so long as the main design remains current, and that is the term of protection in Australia, it's only 10 years. A subsequent design may be, sub may be substantially similar in overall impression to the main design, uh, which again doesn't destroy the main design, doesn't destroy the novelty of the subsequent design. Uh, the designs re remain independent from each other, except their terms of registration are linked, and I'll get to that point in a minute. The Register of Design or their delegate would compare the main and subsequent designs at the time of linking to determine if they are similar. And I'm not too sure what that looks like, but obviously there would be a step process between uh, granting the registration um, and obviously and seeing the subsequent design um, being allowed on the register. And the term of protection of the subsequent design would end at the maximum term of the main design. And as I said, under Australian law, that would be 10 years. So thinking of just in terms of filing a main design first and then a subsequent design, so two or three years later, you may only get eight, maybe nine years on that subsequent design, given that it's linked to the term of registration of the main design. I hope that makes sense. Uh, in terms of infringement, the third party's conduct before the filing date of the subsequent design would not amount to infringement. But it may amount, he may infringe the main design, obviously, because it's substantially similar uh, in overall impression. Also, a third party's conduct may, uh, could make a subsequent design unprotectable if they publish or use an independently created design similar to the subsequent design. So, there's a clear concern about this proposal, I think, and that is uh, the overall scope of the registration may, may drift, uh, that is, from the main designs in a way that. You could have three or four subsequent designs 
uh, end up looking quite different from the main design, even though those tests are in place. Another concern is the nature and the timing of the request of linking. That would also um, would also likely occur when the main design is raised as a citation or an objection um, in respect to the subsequent design or during an examination or court proceeding where the design has been challenged. And finally, the, the proposal provides subsequent design with an extended grace period, which is in respect of the main design. And I assume that this will operate such that any uses of the main design during and after the main design growth period will be disregarded from the subsequent design. So the question now for everyone to consider, and I guess assess is whether uh, the linking of subsequent designs will make the Australian design system more or less complex and whether they will de deliver the benefits uh, that I guess as IP Australia has to, has to see. So for my final uh, slide and my final uh, remarks. I don't want to sort of get too much into the weeds anymore, but I think that um, after 10 years of reform and since the start of the ACIP inquiry, there still remains an elephant in the room and, per and perhaps several uh, baby elephants as well. The most obvious one is why Australia has not joined the Hague Agreement, especially considering China's accession in 2022. A remark made in the uh, cost benefit analysis report. Um, about uh, being a tipping point for Australia to join. Um, I'm sorry, I, I put that in there. And um, not knowing that I was going to be talking about it today, but anyway, I'll pick that back a little bit. And the recent conclusion of the a, um, Australian uh, UK free trade agreement where Australia stated it would, would make all reasonable efforts to join the Hague Agreement. And just as a historical sort of footnote, this also follows Australia's commitment in 2005 with the uh, Australia US free trade agreement to make best interests to join. Um, Slow know, process. If, huh? you, if you're <laughs> counting, um, stop now. Uh, it's been quite a, quite a way. But there is a difference between all reasonable and best efforts, I would argue. But uh, I'll let the international policy about you know, argue that. Uh, and the other issue that is linked to the Hague Agreement is the term of protection. Uh, if Australia were to sign the Geneva Agreement, it would have to increase its maximum term of protection from uh, 10 years to 15 years. And we may see it one day, we just don't know, um, in my lifetime at least. Uh, and finally, the copyright um, design overlap. This has been an issue hanging around in Australian law for quite a while, um, only because we've got more copyright lawyers than we have design experts. And it continues to cause headaches for policy makers and design owners alike. At present, the copyright uh, protection. Uh, so, the design will initially have copyright protection, as you'd imagine, to the um, uh, designs, but it will lose protection once the design is registered or left unregistered once it has been industrially applied. And this means that a designer who makes more than 50 copies of a prototype design will then um, have or then offer for sale, they will lose their copyright protection uh, of that design. And I think that is me for tonight. And thank you very much. And if there's any questions, I'll take them up on the uh, from the side. So thanks, thanks Tyrone. Thanks also to Jeff. Um, I've certainly got some questions, but let me open up to you guys first. I see Darren has a hand up. Um, you, you talked at the beginning about the um, the repair clauses, so the, mm. the must match whatever. And the wording of that has always bothered me, and it still bothers me because it's not clear whether it's a ban on registration or it's a or it's an exception to infringement. Right. So that is one thing that has been clarified by moving it from Article 110 right up into the defences. So that that has now been clarified. So in, in so then, so you can register it. Yes. That's fine. That, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. 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 We have we have a look here. Where? Where? Sorry, just to get one up because um, I think we've been behind the rest. Of the yeah. Yeah. Let me say what maybe about incremental designs, which you know I love it when things get rebranded. Um, but quite a an old idea that we used to have, which applied to all types. From industrial property. We used to have on patents, we used to have what we call patent addition. So if you came up with a minor variation a little bit later, you could file it and your earlier patent couldn't be cited against you, but you'd be stuck with the same term as the earlier patent and you could 
You couldn't sell them separately, they had to stay in the same hands. Likewise, for trademarks, you've got an earlier cited mark of your own mark, you'd have to associate and keep the two together. And also so with designs, you associated the two and that you couldn't sell them separately and they had the same, you know, same lifetime. And it's what the US still does, what we call a terminal disclaimer. If you have a later patent that is too similar to an earlier one that you own, then the term of the later one will be limited to what the term of the earlier one is. So it's that this this kind of general idea has been out there for a little while. Japan also <coughs> implemented something again with a different name. Um, and so it's interesting to see it coming up in Australia because we've had some interesting cattle in Europe where car companies, right? They like to re green their car designs every few years. So, um, um, then the Chrysler changed the design a little bit, their Mercedes S Class, and then tried to register the new, slightly changed S Class design. And it was refused, they were told it's too similar to your existing car that's already on the market. That's the same over impressions earlier. Really and that's the difficulty, a little bit of a dilemma that you have as a designer. You want to change things, keep them fresh, but if you but you want to keep them looking somewhat the same. And it's precisely this kind of refreshed but still somewhat the same design that can get caught where you don't know if your earlier design is really broad and it's going to catch all these little later variations or not. So you want to have your cake and eat it. You want your earlier broad design and also um, your whatever currently on the market. So I think that, you know, it'd be interesting, but I think, you know, you see people in Europe looking a bit enviously at this incremental design thing if it, if it comes in. Uh, and as I say, I think we need to have it under the name of, of associated design. So, you know, I mean, something maybe even for the IPA, you never know. Uh, open floor, once more, questions. I think there's some more work, design work with common law jurisdictions of Canada, Australia, etc. And it's the first time I've heard of this. <clears throat> if you produce 50 or more, you don't get copyright protection. So you have to you have to have design protection, mm -hmm. essentially. I was wondering why in the UK that is in, so is it to, something which we consider because we used to have it. Right. And we got rid of it with the 1956 copyright tags oh, and put okay. in place in state. Limited term copyright protection that only lasted as long as the design, the rest of the design. So it used to be you only you had to have a design. Then we replaced that. Actually, it was the sixty eight design copyright act. We replaced that with something that gave you copyright, but only for as long as you would have had if you registered your design. Mm -hmm. And then we kept that, and it was called Section fifty two of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. We got rid of that in twenty thirteen because of a decision of the European Court called FLOSS. So we had, it was the same test, many 50 sold one, and if you've done that, your, your, your copyright was curtailed to 25 years, which is the equivalent of what a design registration would be given you. So, the courts yeah. have been flexible with 50, it doesn't have to be more than 50, that's why I want to say around 50. No, no, no. Uh, no Australian no, courts have said that, you know, it's still up to the clear description for you. I guess it's like a lot more than that. Okay. Yeah. But 50 is very important. Say that you copyright regulation. But does it have some kind of impact on innovation? Is that what you keep it? Is there any. Oh, I mean, because, I mean, the policy idea is that you have inductual products and it's more su suitable to pick those on the design that you rather than you copyright. But also, copyright is 70% the life of the author, 70 plus the life of the author. And obviously, industrial products being protected for that long in the marketplace is undivided, according to that. That's true. And you, yeah, that's right. And there, there's a saving in the burning and banking, which lets you cut the term down a bit for designs. You can cut it down, you can't cut it down to less than 25 years, which is still quite a bit longer than 10 years for a yeah, design operation. So, yeah. But yeah, you'll still find a few countries with a made 50 sold one rule, uh, either to get rid of copyright altogether or to limit the term. Uh, thank you. I'd, I'd like to come back to the draft design or treaty of Wirecard. Um, very interesting presentation, Jack, and I, I don't follow these issues at all. So as you were talking, I was thinking, why is there a diplomatic conference now? It seems to have been going on for years and years and years. 
Um, and I had a quick look at the uh, minutes of this, the WIPO Standing Committee on Trademarks, Industrial Designs and Geographical Indications. And I could see a year ago that the African group, for example, were blocking um, the transmission of, of a draft text to the uh, WIPO General Assembly because and it says here, I didn't know all this, because of, uh, in particular, because of Article 3 of the draft DLT, uh, they wanted to link um, uh, traditional cultural expressions, traditional knowledge and genetic resources to be included as an industrial design. So uh, uh, that was really interesting just to, to find all this out and it was prompted by your talk. So my question is really, where are we now? I mean, have we solved these types of issues that have been resolved? Or all these things still hanging around needing to be dealt with before the uh, November 2024 diplomatic conference? So there isn't a green text on the Article 3 point, which is essentially the, the point of this agreement on Article 3 was um, it was a requirement, uh, well, the African group particularly, but also others, wanted there to be a substantive requirement uh, to disclose any traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expression, or genetic resources that a design was based on at the point of uh, applying for the design. Um, the UK internationally doesn't recognise those terms as as types of intellectual property. Um, we believe they're protected by by other part, types of intellectual property. Um, we're not the only ones. Uh, so the state, there's, that has always been, that was always the traditional sticking point, and that's why it's stayed where it was um, until the 2022 General Assemblies. At the 2022 General Assemblies, the proposal was put to a vote, which is not something that traditionally happened at the WIPO General Assemblies. WIPO as a United Nations body. Um, you know, I'm not going to comment on anything around the Security Council or anything like that, but the, as a United Nations body, the WIPO, WIPO is traditionally does everything by consensus. If you don't have consensus, you don't get agreement. But in this case, the proposal for a diplomatic conference was put to a vote, and it was voted through, um, which has, as I said, kick-started the process. Um, to answer your, the, the core of your question, has that issue been resolved at this point? Uh, I would say no. Um, so it's one of the issues that yeah. needs to be resolved. I think there is a one of the variants. So the, the draft treaty contains quite a few options, yeah. and that yeah. is one of the options is a uh, to provide for a disclosure of the original source of traditional expressions. Yes, yeah. right. So it, it remains an issue to be resolved. But because you know, in some respects, it's a thin end of the wedge issue. I don't know that Joe. You know, I can't comment about that, but it really the heat of that debate is all about patents and exploitation of traditional knowledge of medicaments and things like that. And that so this is a little bit of a proxy war mm -hmm. about TK in the context of patents where it actually has huge economic value as opposed to designs where it kind of doesn't, not so much. So, you know, that's what's really going on there. Yeah, and, and just to add a bit more to that, there is another diplomatic conference happening next year at WIPO, uh, and it will actually, by the look of it, be in WIPO in Geneva uh, on, uh, that arises from discussions around the IGC, the Intergovernmental Committee at WIPO, where traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions are normally discussed. Uh, and that particular diplomatic conference is about genetic resources and how they, reserve, how they relate to patents. So, that diplomatic conference, subject to discussions of WIPO on Wednesday, um, is likely to be in May uh, and will play out certain dynamics, and then those will quite probably feed into the members' diplomatic conference as well. Because the yeah. issues are, in, in, uh, as David says, the core, the core ask is, is in balance. Yeah. To Uma's point, Uma, who you can <coughs> see there, um, I, I think you said. That this was a um, uh, Australian um, traditional necklace you're wearing, is that right? Mm -hmm. So I don't know where key traditional expressions are in Australia. Is there specific protections for? We've got traditional necklaces like the Maori. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we have, I don't think it's yeah. yeah, yeah. 
I mean, but it, it yeah. takes a long time to get to this point as well, mm -hmm. as you can appreciate it. Uh, Uber and I are supervising a student who I don't think is here tonight, but she's doing um, uh, her uh, thesis on uh, TK in the context of the Scottish Islands and British traditional cultural knowledge. I mean, you know, it's interesting to look at the, the Lisbon Treaty, for example, requires the EU to safeguard and develop the European cultural heritage. So, I mean, I think five years ago, I was seeing this as an Africa being difficult to see, but actually in the broader context, it's, you know, it's a, it's an evolving issue that we're all looking at a little bit. So. Uh, could I just say a word? Mm, yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. I really enjoyed it. Um, I suppose this is in relation to what, um, two points first. Firstly, in relation to what Dave just said about our PhD student, Kay Dunn, um, she is looking into Scottish uh, um, cultural heritage. And she tried, she said, to interview someone at UKIPO um, and, and, and got a direct answer saying, we do not think it is an issue. Um, and it's interesting, Dave, because she managed to get her interviews with the Scot uh, um, Scottish, um, you know, uh, MPs and the, the, the Scottish Heritage Board, as well as the Harris Tweed, who all think that we should be take um, the United Kingdom should be incorporating some of these treaties, and that there is a huge gap. So that's just one interesting issue about the fact that. In the UK, there seems to be perhaps um, a devolving view coming from Scotland um, as to the notion of heritage and IPRs. The second thing, it's to all, all, all of you, um, and it's a question that has teased me throughout my uh, waking moments in the last 20 years, which is, do you think design law is far too complicated? Well, of course, uh, as a practitioner, we like complicated. Um, but is it too complicated? I, I, I think, I think it's. My own view is, I like some of the things they have in Italy, where they sometimes have a design jury. I like what they have in Scandinavia, where they get opinions from the local chamber of commerce. I kind of like American jury trials for designs, not for patents, but for design. I think it's it, we should have design law that consumers can get, you know, and designers can get. So in that sense, I agree with you. I, don't, I think making it too artificial and divorced from the way real people feel designs, which is about connection, making an emotional connection between people, consumers and products, and designers and consumers and designers and products. I think, uh, yeah, there is. A, uh, that, I I think there is that risk. Yeah. What do you think, guys? Is I not too complicated? Does it sound complicated? It actually does. My other burning question is about the role of product in design. This was also a special topic of the Apple Design Committee in Singapore. Uh, last month, and it's very noticeable listening to Tyrone that product runs all the way through your presentation, and even for a graphical user interface, I think you said it would have to be four o'clock in which you make it yeah. And in Europe, we chucked that away 20 years ago for no apparent reason. Nobody else, I think, followed us. And also, the committee asked me, are there cases where a design has been enforced against a product which is a different product from the ostensible one, and I can't find a case. I did see, I think, in your slides, the laundry ball massage thing, but that's a validity one that so showed, showed the principle of life, but those that happen. And so they all said to me, and I think they're right, but you know, this is a freedom to operate nightmare because you don't, you can't search in a particular class for the design you look for, you've got to search everywhere. So it causes a huge burden on third parties, and yet the evidence is. It's never actually affected anybody in real life. So, A, should we ditch it? And B, was there any, since we're apparently amending the EU design law, 
well, not we, they, um, was there any discussion that perhaps we could bring design back the products and back into the real world? And it sort of goes, because I think it makes design all more complicated to disembody designs for a product. If you say it's a design for a product, everybody knows what you mean. If you say, well, it's a design, but it could be for anything. Well, you know, how is my design for a telephone box applicable to a spoon? Well, it isn't. Sure. You know, it, it's 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 a it's a theoretical nonsense, it's a legal nonsense, it's a practical nonsense, it's a practical nightmare. So I think, uh, yeah. So in, indeed, uh, Uma, uh, as a result of the consultations for the legal review we did, did indeed put what's the product there for pretty squarely on our list of things that we thought the the commission should clarify what happened after we put that in the legal review was that there was a case that reached the court of justice called easy sanitary solutions in which the court of justice then did clarify what the existing law meant and they said the existing law means product is irrelevant for novelty and for infringement purposes so um we said it needs clarifying it got clarifying. You may well think it got clarified the wrong way. Um, there is a change proposed in the European design law, which goes some way to clarifying. And so the clarification is to add that although product indications do not affect the scope of protection of design as such, alongside the representation, they may serve to determine the nature of product in which the design is incorporated. Now, what's what's that all about? Well, uh, what that's about is the nature of the product to which the design is incorporated forms then part of the test for whether you have the same overall impression or not. So it could be uh, that this will play towards when you do the same overall impression comparison, which is the one you do for validity purposes when you're looking at whether it's different from the prior design and for infringement purposes maybe the nature of the product as indicated by the indication of product will play into that comparison and that could take you to a place somewhat like Jeff described where you get a how similar is the product test as well as a how similar is the design test going on after all that's what we do for trademarks you know we're not strictly limited by the identified goods in trademark law but the similarity or difference of the product so i think they might you know just looking at future directions it's possible it, it will go that way which is something the japanese law certainly had until recently i don't know if it still has it, but you know you would only infringe the application of a similar product there is a sort of well-known example case where a different product uh, has infringed uh, in a couple of different cases and that is where you get you've got a car maker and someone selling replica models like uh, the old, what were they called, those little models we used to get, manual. Yeah, exactly. So um, so that's the one case where another product will look identical. And you can broaden that a bit. I mean, so in terms of video games, a racing video game will have cars that are identical to the original. So, so there are some cases where it's perhaps a logical thing to do. Um, and uh, um, in the US, for example, one of the, the things you can do is register a design for a car or model car, a car or a toy car or something like that. So so there are a couple of classic areas where you get that. But um, still, I mean, I'm, yeah, in most cases, it's, it's uh, there's something to be said for drawing in the horns a little bit and, and making the similarity of the product play into the comparison a bit closer. But there's been no suggestion in Australia to move the other way. No, no, not at all. Even with uh, introducing virtuals, um, there's still be a linking of the product in terms of the active state of the product or the device. Anything? Uh, any, any more questions? I mean, I think it's been interesting to me, again, once more thanks to all our speakers, it's been very interesting to me to see some of these parallel tracks along which design law reform is evolving, perhaps entirely independently, perhaps informed by what's going on elsewhere. Um, it, it, watch this space for what happens uh, in, in the UK and internationally in the design law treaty. So um, thanks for your attention. Let's have a
a glass of wine and a nibble. Please stick around for a bit of a chat afterwards. And uh, that's it for, for now. So thanks once more. Thank you and bye.